Martha starts first. She walks four miles an hour. Carol starts two hours later. Um, she walks six runs, six miles per hour. So let's look at A. Write an equation to represent the distance Martha travels. Distance Martha travels. Uh, who's got the, the equation and an explanation of that equation? Mitch? Y1 equals x1 times t1, so y equals distance x equals miles per hour and t equals time. Y1 well, equals what? x1 times t1. Um, okay, so y represents? y represents distance. Distance for Martha. Mm -hmm. x1 x represents? Miles per hour for Martha. Uh, let's say like uh, her rate. The rate at which she's moving. Yeah. Okay, and T is time. The time she's time. on it. Martha's time. Yeah. Okay? What's that? Distance equals rate times Distance time. Distance equals rate times time. Who's ever heard that before? That's a legit formula. Yeah, that's a formula that gets used all the time. Distance equals rate times time. Uh, so your equation may have different variables in it, but this is as, as, as bare bones as it gets, as, as mathematical as it gets. The output of the first function being the function for Martha's distance given her time is equal to her uh, speed times uh, her time. Now, can we get more specific than that though? You put the uh, rate in. Her, we know her rate, right? It's what? Four. Four, so let's just say D equals 4T. Will that do? Is that it? Is that it? But the distance is 26.2 miles. Okay, well, that's a tricky one. We know that the marathon is 26.2 miles, okay? But let's look at the questions that get asked. Are they asking, um, you know, it's, it's not saying write an equation for how long it will take her to, to walk 26.2 miles but just write an equation representing the distance Martha that travels, okay? And I guess if, if we didn't know anymore, we, we could say that the distance she travels is 26.2. We gotta think about what, what starts to get asked, like uh, uh, catch up with Martha. When will Carol catch up with Martha? That's the question. That may be at 26.2 miles and it may not be, all right? So we need to leave it as we're not sure yet, we don't know. Now, if we did plug 26.2 miles in, we could figure out how much time it would take her to go 26.2 miles. Um, but we don't want to know necessarily that. We want to know when Carol will catch up with her. Okay. We're going to leave that open. We want to find the distance and the time that's the same for both. Um, right equation represents the distance Carol travels. Well, that's going to be a lot the same, isn't it? Distance equals rate time. Um, D. Should we use D? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, we're going to make it so that the distances are the same, right? So, or maybe we don't want to. We want to say this is the is Martha's distance and this is Carol's distance. We can call them now. They're different. Yeah, they can be different. Okay. The rate. Do we know the rate? Do we know Carol's rate? Six miles an hour. Okay. So D equals six T. Minus two, though, because she doesn't start at the same time. As so what we need to re recognize is that this t right here, this t that we're using here is uh, is time for Martha. If I just put a t there, I need to recognize it's supposed to be Carol's time, right? Well, calling the variables t, m, and t, c, not very helpful. But we know that if like if we want to use the same t. This t would have to be t minus 2. Because Martha's been traveling for two hours already before Carol ever does anything, right? So let me kind of show you that. Uh, that. Let's see. Um, I guess we're just going to compare two things here. Like if we look at Martha's time, Carol's time. 
If I plug in two for Martha, how many hours has that been for Carol? Zero. Zero hours. One hour, sorry, three hours for Martha is? One hour for Carol. T hours for Martha is? We always take this guy and we subtract two. So now we can replace this T with a T that compares it to Martha. And that's your transit. Well, that's A and B. Solve the system of equations. Maybe this wording doesn't make any sense, but certainly we understand. Uh, find when Carol will match up, will catch up to Martha. When Carol will catch up to Martha. Well, we want to find the when, right? The when is the time. We want the time to be the same. Agreed? Yes. Yes, we want the time to be the same. What else do we want to be the same? We want the distance to be the same. Okay. I can plug in any time I want in here, and then I plug that same time in there, and I'll get some, some distance. I can, I can make a table for T and then Martha's distance and Carol's distance. And I can plug in times, right? One, two, three, four, five, until what happens? Until what are equal? Could you set the two equations equal to each other, then plug something in and solve? Well, plug something in. Like, set it, like, do the, the E equals so, or T. D equals 4t equals 6. Of course, do this math. 4t. Yeah. And do what? And like, set so the equal to each other. Sure. Yeah, okay, so let me, sh let me show you this here. If you're like firing all cylinders, this makes total sense, great. If not, let me point something out. Um, we want Martha's distance to be equal to Carol's distance, right? Okay, we want them to be equal. So what is Martha's distance? It's 4t. What is Carol's distance? 6 times t minus 2. We want this, this is equal to Martha's time, or distance, this is equal to Carol's distance, and we want them to be equal. So what happens when one thing is equal to another thing, which is equal to another thing, which is equal to another thing? All the things are equal, right? We can eliminate all this middle stuff. Oh, this is not necessary. We can see how, like Wes was saying, 4t equals 6 times t minus 2. You know where you say plug stuff in? Yeah, like I plugged 2 in. Okay. And then I got 4. But we so plug 2. Well, whatever we plug in for t, what should happen on, like, what should happen on both sides of the equation? We should get the same. It should be the same. Yeah. Well, rather than guessing what t is, what, how else can we approach Solve for t. Plug in numbers? I said it's besides that, instead of doing that. That is incorrect. That takes guesswork. This is precise. So we just say, well, what's t? We solve for t. So we got 4t equals 6t minus 12. I'll subtract 6t from both sides. I'll bring it up here. Negative 2t equals negative 12. If I have a negative 2, t is 6. No guesswork. No, oh, I got it wrong. We found that t is 6. What does that mean, t is 6? Six hours later. Six hours later, which is at what time? 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock. Because t is Martha's time. Martha started at 10, and 6 hours after 10 o'clock is 4 o'clock. Well, that's A, B, and C. Let's look at what B is. Okay. Um, so part B, Carol wants to reduce her time, reduce the time it takes to catch up to Martha by one hour. How can she do this by changing first her starting time? That's one option. That means that her speed stays the same. Please stop that. Let's pay attention. Let's just be quiet. 
Or how could she do this by changing her speed, which would mean her her uh, delay would be the same. She'd still start two hours later. So let's look at the starting time. How can we adjust the starting time? Should we just do this? This is what I thought when I first uh, looked at this problem. I just thought, hey, um, her distance is going to be equal to 6 times t minus 1, right? Start an hour earlier. And that seems to make sense. But what I didn't realize to start with was she'll actually catch up to her a lot sooner than she wanted to, right? She only wants to catch up to her what, one hour earlier, which means time will be, time should be what? Three, Three o'clock, yeah. but how many hours? Like t, hours. This, uh, this value of t should be five. If you uh, figure all that out, you'll find out that t is much less than five. Well, that's because by starting an hour earlier, she not only is starting to run six miles an hour an hour earlier, she's always also giving uh, Martha an hour less to get ahead of her. Right? And so she's going to catch up to her very quickly. So we can't just put minus one. We, we don't know what her head start should be. We don't know, or sorry, what Martha's head start should be. We don't know what Carol's delay should be. Do we know how much time it should take? We do. How much time? Five hours. Five hours. So we do know that this lady who runs at six miles an hour should run for five minus x hours. And that that should be equal to what Carol does, right? Or what Martha does. At four times what? Five hours. She wants the Martha, no, Carol wants it to take five hours. So we plug five hours in for T. So we get 20 equals uh, 30 minus 6x. Negative 10 equals negative 6x. And so x equals uh, 1 and uh, 2 thirds. 1 and 2 thirds. Okay, so x equals 1 and 2 thirds. What does that mean, x equals 1 and 2 thirds? Earlier than she did before? No, she just, just starts one at one and two thirds hours. One and two thirds hours after, after Martha. After Martha. Uh, Instead of two hours later, she starts one and two thirds hours. That's kind of kind of interesting. I was kind of surprised by that result. Just leaving uh, twenty minutes earlier, she'll catch up to Martha. How how much faster? Just needs to leave 20 hours earlier, or and she'll catch up in one hour instead of two hours. Well, in five hours instead of six hours. She'll cut an hour off that time. Well, let's look at the other idea. Rather than changing her time, how about if she changes her speed? Okay. So her time is still the same. Her time is still t minus 2. Martha's time minus 2. <coughs> um, but what's her speed? Faster. Huh? Faster, but we don't know. Something faster, but we don't know. So we'll let that be the variable. And we know that we want this time to be 5. And that should be equal to Martha. She's going at 4 miles an hour for 5 hours. We know we want to catch her 5 hours instead of 6. 20 equals 5x minus 2x. 20 equals 3x. So we divide 20 by 3. Okay, so that is that's our speed. And that comes out to be 6 and uh, 2 thirds. What does that mean? x is equal to 6 and 2 thirds in this case, where x represents okay. 6 and 2 thirds. That's how fast she needs to go in miles. Instead of six miles an hour, six and two thirds miles an hour. In one hour, instead of going six, she should go six point six 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 miles. Other questions? It's fascinating, then.
So Calvin and Hobbes are having a, a sledding race, and Calvin trips Hobbes, so Hobbes is delayed. Uh, Calvin jumps down the hill, and it's going seven feet a second. Uh, Hobbes gets up, dusts himself off, gets a running start, and heads down the hill at nine seconds after Calvin. Um, and Hobbes is going 12 feet per second. We're going to write two equations, one given Calvin's speed and head start. Write an equation for the distance he will travel in two seconds. So again, we have a d equals rt situation. If I go this rate for this amount of time, I will multiply those together. That will tell me the distance that I've gone. Okay. So Calvin's distance will be equal to his rate. What's his rate? Seven, seven, seven feet per second. Okay. And uh, how will we represent his time? So it doesn't have to have a C there. D equals 70. That's great. That, that is part A. That's what we're looking for. Part B. Uh, Hobbes' distance is equal to what? 12. T minus 9. Yeah. T minus 9. Because his time is 9 seconds less. Right? 9 seconds less. 9 seconds fewer this time frame. You want this time to be the same as this time frame. Um, <coughs> does everybody understand that? Yeah? Just a quick question, could you have it the opposite of that? So could you have it where the first one is 17 plus 9? Very good, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. It just depends on like what does T represent? If T represents Calvin's time, then Hobbes' time is 9 seconds less than that. If T represents, let's just alternate reality over here, if we say d equals 12 t, and t represents Hobbes' time, then Calvin has more or less time. More. He has more time, because he took nine seconds you know, more than, Calvin, or than, than Hobbes had. So his could be, uh, what was that? Seven times uh, t plus nine more seconds. Yeah, good point. Either one of these. ask for anything there, right? Uh, other than those two equations. I didn't ask you to figure out what T or D or anything like that was, like uh, the homework problem. Just asking for the equation. We'll use this in a little bit after we're done with the review. All right, next, so we're going to graph the line. Um, so you'll notice we're, I don't have graphing piecewise functions question because uh, a good number of you have improved to the point it's like, all right, it seems like as a class at least, is getting that. Uh, doesn't mean that everybody's understanding or everybody's getting it 100% correct, but enough people are getting four out of five or five out of five, right? making a little mistake, if any. If you're still having trouble, then you've got to figure out how to rectify that. Come in after school and ask a question before school, watch a video that I've made, watch a video somebody else has made, ask them, your mom, your cousin, your uncle. You, you have to participate in that. you got to rectify it somehow. And I would be absolutely thrilled to help you if you want to come and work with me and ask me questions outside of class. But even those of you who are getting really close are still making mistakes. Just like you understand, okay, there's this, this, this border between the two functions. This function goes here, this function goes there. But when it comes to actually graphing a line, you're making some pretty common mistakes. So uh, let's just graph this real quick. This. And we'll also think about why we're putting points where we do. I can put a point there on the y-axis down at negative 5. But the, the problem is, and the, the reason I wanted to revisit it is because some people may be putting a point on the negative 5 of the x-axis. So that is, no. I mean, there's just not a point there. Right? So let's think about why there is a point at 0, negative 5. Why is there a point on the y-axis at negative 5? Correct? Okay, well that, what I'm trying to make a difference between is I remembered it correctly, and I understand why there, why there is a point. Why do I know? How can I be sure there's a point there other than I am really good at remembering and I remember that that minus five means the y-intercept. What's a graph made of? Point. What's point represent? 
Inputs and outputs. Inputs and outputs. Okay, so if that represents an input and output, how do I know for sure there's a point on the y-axis at negative 5? It really means something about the equation. Mitch. You plug in 0 for x, and you just find out plug in 0 for x. That, that's why we use the y-intercept, because when you write it in this form, the slope-intercept form, it's really easy to see that. If we plug 0 in there, because this would just get eliminated, being multiplied by 0, we know that we're going to wind up with a negative 5 for our output. Okay, so I know that. I know that if I plug in a 0 for x, I'll get a negative 5 for y, and that's why there's a point on the y-axis. Now, do we always think that when we're plotting the y-intercept? Y I've been doing this for lots and lots of years. I don't. But if I ever questioned myself, even for a split second, and I said, does this point go on the y-axis or the x-axis? Is it down 5 or is it to the left 5? I'm going to not hope that I remember it correctly and just take a guess. I'm going to say, OK, I know a point represents an input and an output. So is it 0, negative 5, or is it negative 5, 0? That's what I'm asking myself. <coughs> uh, well, what was it? Right? And so I would try both of those. When I put a negative 5, do I get 0? No. 5 halves times negative 5. Well, it's not 5. It's some fraction that I would subtract 5. Get it. So it's not 0. So that's not it. Now I remember, oh, there's a point on the y-axis of negative 5. Because if I plug in 0 for x, obviously, I'll get y is negative 5. So no, that's not, that's, that's not a point. This is the correct one. Okay. So how do we find another point? Right? We need two points to graph this line. We need to find an easy point. Brennan? Plug in 0 for the y. If you can plug in 0 for the y, you're going to, well, in this case, it just happens <coughs> to work out nicely. That could be something that you do. Let me just suggest, uh, like, put this to you. Like, if we had y equals 4 thirds x minus 7. In this case, if we plug in 0, let's see what happens. We get 0 equals 5 halves x minus 5. Okay, we add 5 to both sides. Get 5 equals 5 halves x. How do we get x by itself? You divide by 5 halves. Divide by 5 halves, multiply by 2 fifths, yeah? Five multiply by 2 fifths. Now that works out nicely. Because this happens to be 5 and this happens to be 5, so we get 2. Great. We're concentrating on the, the real truth is, you know, what's the input and output? Now, if it's written in slope intercept form, I wouldn't suggest always plugging in 0 for x or 0 for y because 4 thirds x. 7, now we have 7 equals 4 thirds x. Multiply by 3 fourths. It's more like a 4 than a 9. Now it doesn't work out nicely when we get some weird fraction. It's a point, it is true. It, there is a point there for this graph. But it didn't work out as well. Yes, Brandon, more you have to say. Plug in 2 for x. Plug in 2 for x. Now why 2 for x? Because it's e to the small t kind. Because 2 divides 2. If it were a 3, we'd want to plug in a 3. If it was a 7, we'd want to plug in a 7. Yeah. Okay. Or, if I'm just doing the quick shortcut, I start here and do what? Go up 5. Yes? Go up 5 and over 2. Go up 5 and over 2, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, go up 5 and over 2. Why? Because of what Brennan said. Because if you plug in 2, that's the next easiest value uh, of x to plug in. We get a nice uh, whole number answer. Um, is that the only point we could find? Isn't there a point right here? Yeah. And this one? Yeah. That's a point there. Yeah. There's how many points? Oh, an infinite number that we could have found here or here or here. Anything could have been our second point. Why did we find that one? Because 2 is easily divisible by 2. 2 so. is divisible by 2, so I would want to go to x is not, not x is a, a, a seventh, and not x is 1, and not x is 1 and a half, because those don't work out very well. Those aren't nice. 
2. 2 is the next value of x that works out nicely. And what's the next one after that? 4. four. And uh, the 1, if we go the other way, like if I start at 0, what if negative I go? 2. I would want to go to negative 2, negative 4, negative 6, negative 8, and so on. Okay. So if Mr. Stewart, when you yep. asked when, like, y2, it's also given to the new equation. Say again? 2 is already given because it's in the equation. 2 is given? This 2? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean given? Like if, because you always have to have a given when you, like, when you write out certain problems. Uh -huh. So it's already given. Because like you said, 2 is also easy, but it's also in the equation, so it's already given, so it basically gives you the answer. But does it tell me the answer that, that if I plug in 2, I get 0 for x, or 0 for y? Well, not necessarily. Okay, not necessarily. But since you're just graphing it, it's already given. Here, let me, I'm curious. Let me just write another equation up here, like y equals 4, 7, x plus 3. So I put a point at 0, 3, because if I plug in 0 for x, I get 3 for y. Mm -hmm. And then tell me more about what you, what you were saying about the previous problem. Like, um, well, like you said, 2 is just easier, but for this, since it's in the equation, you go um, up 7 over 4, right? Is it up 7 over 4? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven. Seven. Yeah, just kidding. Up four over seven. Right, up four over seven. Y over seven over is horizontal. X is horizontal. X is seven, right? Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the next value of X you want to plug in because that would be the next easiest one. And that would move us up four as well. We would add yeah. four when that, that denominator gets canceled. Yeah, up four over, I think I'm over seven. It's hard to tell from this perspective. No, it's way off. Not good, but better. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like it's just given. Do you know what I mean? The are you are you talking about the slope then? Yeah. Yeah. Like if we can really follow given. the slope, but I mean, your mistake of going up seven over four brings up my point that if we flip the the up and the over, we just get it backwards. How would we ever know that it's wrong? Well, no, I mean, if you wouldn't really know that you're wrong if you went up 7 over 4 instead of up 4 over 7. Unless you just think the rise is overrun all the time. Okay, that means that you just remember it real hard, right? So you know the rise. 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 Okay. But people forget it all the time. They make it, they flip it. The thing that will guarantee I don't forget is, you know, let me just double check. Is it up? Is it up 7 over 4? Well, what does that mean? It means that I'm at an x of 4. If I plug in 4, will that move me up 7? Oh, no. If I plug in 4 for x, that's not going to cancel out. I remember it's over 7 because x needs to be 7 because x is 7 cancels out this denominator of 7. That reminds me that, oh, right, the, the bottom one. That is the the horizontal of the x. All right. Um, continuing on one more here. All right. So write the equation of the line that passes through the two points. I hope that from our discussion last time, it did, it sunk in. So I wanted to see if it did sink in. Um, so we got two points. So what can I find with those two points if I want to write this equation? Slope. Slope. Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. So negative uh, 14 over negative 4 or positive 7 over 2. Okay. So that is my slope. Plug what in? Plug in a point. Any point? No, it's a point. 
one of those two. Well, one of those two, of course. Yeah. I don't want to take a random away. Because I know this point and this point, it will make the equation equal on both sides. So that means that if I plug one in, which is a slope, that if I solve for b, that must be the b that works in the equation. So 6 for y, slope is 7 halves, x is 2, and there's our b that we're going to solve for. 2 is cancel, we get 6 equals 7 plus b, b equals 1, y equals 7 halves x minus 1. Colin? Does that make sense? You said you didn't, that was the part you yeah, didn't know. Yeah, I know. Good now, so the x or the y you pick is the y, obviously, mm -hmm. and then times the x out of the out of the same point. Okay. Yeah. Y is five. Yeah. So she put this point um, there because this one, this. Thing? No, because she thought like the five was right, and yeah. she thought the like yeah. Y. Oh, so she was she trying to use know what she's doing. this. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, she I mean, went if, over to a five. If you or do it wrong, I guess that's always true. But oh, yeah, that's okay. It doesn't seem you know it doesn't mean you're hopeless. So she's trying to. West, you're saying she's trying she's to use hopeless. the slope. Yeah. But that's. Like from the original y point. This point? Yeah, five over two, she started at zero. See that a lot. Okay. And what what what's happened to Nanette? Why does she do that? Why does she make this mistake? What? Because she didn't check the term. Okay, maybe because she didn't oh. check. That's assuming she knows how to check. I mean she uh, she understands what her graph is. She went too high from zero and she just didn't have the knowledge to make sure that it came from the y-intercept and not from the origin. What knowledge would be that? What would that be that she's missing? Slope, knowledge is slope, like that you start from the y-intercept and not from the, or, from the origin. Well, that sounds like a memory thing, right? Does well, she also doesn't know rise over run, because then if she tried to check it with the rise over run right there. Uh -huh. She does know rise over run. She knows rise over run. She knows up five over two. She went up five and she went over two. We got to go over two the last time. Yeah, the second time. The second time. There's no second time. What are you talking about? The reason why she did it, <laughs> <laughs> as you just said, she just started, she went up she started here yeah. and went up five and over two. You need to go from no, that point. Oh, like if she went from the point, uh -huh. she would have been up five over two, and then that time would have been over four. Like right. From the yeah, if she did it right, that's what would have happened. Yeah. But she did she, that was her mistake, yeah. She, like, what she did was, and it's a pretty safe bet, because I've seen it a lot, and I can tell you that's what they're doing, starting at the origin and going up the slope. She knows slope, right? She knows up five over two. She doesn't like, quite know what slope means. Confused. She doesn't know that that means, that means from one point to another point on the line you go up five over two. But she remembers slope. She remembers rise over run. She remembers five over two, up five and over two. But you just, if you're just going up 5 and over 2 and not thinking about why, you don't know about slope, really. Okay? If you're just going up 5 over 2 and you don't know why, you should start today and ask yourself the next time you graph a line, am I doing this correctly? Am, am I plotting points that work in this equation, that x and y make both sides of the equation equal? That's what I really need to ask. It is helpful to know shortcuts and to um, allow yourself to use them so that we're not always plugging in zero and getting the y value, then plugging in two and figuring out what the y value is. We can use the shortcuts. But we don't want to do it to the detriment of our understanding. Okay? So if we do use the slope, it is supposed to be from, the, from another point, right? Of five and over two, we should have a point right there. Of course, we know that we just we just did this a while ago. Um, so 
So why should there? How do I know that there should be a point at two zero? Because I remembered it correctly. But how do I know? How can I prove it? How can I, if somebody says to you, <coughs> you, you show them, okay, put this point here and go up and over, and they say, how do you know that is right? Why? Why would you do that? Because if this you plug in two or zero. If you plug, well, you can plug in two or zero. What would you plug two in for? X. For X, right? Two, that's the X. This is the Y. So if I plug in 2 for X, I'm going to get out, apparently, 0 for Y. Let's just test that hypothesis. 5 halves times 2 over 1 minus 5. Cancel. 5 minus 5. We can get 0. That's how I know there's a point, for sure, at 2, 0. That's how I can check. Yeah. We can check and see if that's correct. If I did follow the slope correctly, it puts me at this point. Is that point on the graph, does that x and that y work in the equation? All right. Then hit that. Okay. All right. Let's go back to. Let me just do it the easy way. So let's say that the hill is 256 feet from top to bottom. Not like vertically, I mean that's how much distance you'll have to travel. Um, you figure out who won this race. Two different times. Okay, which who wins? Like which time wins? If your time is faster. Faster. If you have a, a less time. So we plug in 256 here. We plug in 256 here. See how much time it takes. Whoever takes less time, that person wins. Okay. All right. So somebody somebody wins. Can we find out if they just keep going? at these same speeds, can we figure out when Hobbes will catch up? Yeah, yeah. Set them both equal to each other. Okay. Set them both equal to each other. So these distances, in that case, these distances would need to be the same. So we set them equal to each other. Let's see. That's 9, that's 17 equals 12. Uh, minus. Sides, we get negative 5t equals negative 108. So t equals what? Um, 21.6, you say? 21.6. Okay. Um, so that's the time, <coughs> excuse me, that's the time at which they pass each other. Can we figure out how far that is? Let me figure out how far how far they are once they catch once hops catch up catches up. Plug it into D. T for what? Which T? Both of them. Either of them. Yeah, either of them. I would do uh, not that one. That one. That one. This is an easier equation. Seven times twenty-one point six. What do we get? Uh, 
51.2. Can that tell us who wins? Yeah, you both of them? Yeah. Let's see. So if we put 21.6 in here? Yeah. Okay, 21.6. Let's put 21.6 in there. What do we get? 151.2. Can I have the exact same? Yeah. Is that surprising? Because that's, that's what we were finding out, right? We were figuring out when do they pass each other. Yeah? We were saying this, this, this tells me the distance, and this tells me the distance for Hobbes. So if I set the distances equal to each other and solve for t, what does it tell me? The time when the distances are the same. So the distances are the same here. When, we, when we're setting things equal to each other, that's what needs to happen. It doesn't happen because something went wrong. So what's this distance? What does it mean? That's how far they are when who passes who? Hobbes passes Calvin. Hobbes is going faster. Hobbes is caught up. Hobbes is now passing Calvin. So who wins? Who wins the race? Hobbes. Why? Because he keeps on keeps Yeah, then he just keeps well, getting farther away. Faster and they finally surpass him when his speed has gotten nine seconds over what, seven feet. But how do we know he wins? Well, we don't, because we don't know how long the hill is. Okay, well, that's what I said that a minute ago. Okay, well, there. Now that we know how long the hill is, <laughs> how do we know he wins? Faster time. Faster time? No, the time will. What if we just figure out? Because now that they're equal, he's yeah. going two seconds faster. Or, wait. Five seconds faster than that. It's going, it's going five feet mm. per second faster, but that is only relevant because they pass, Hobbes passes Calvin when? Because he's behind. Or where? Two, or three. Down there. Yeah. And they're racing to? Which is? 256. Which is? Beyond the 151.2, <laughs> so since they pass, or Hobbs passes Calvin before the end of the race, what if they race for 100 feet? Calvin, Calvin. Calvin wins because they won't meet until they're 151 more chooses. Well, really, yes, in life, he wins. <laughs> Okay, so we can answer questions like that by using the simple set them equal to each other idea. Just set them equal to each other thing. Okay. Um, here, let's borrow from the other class real quick. Uh, let's Comparing two memberships, like that happens quite a bit. You might want to have membership at a like a bank or membership at a gym or uh, what's that? Golf course. Golf course uh, at a one video store or maybe nowadays an online video service or another service. A magazine. We try to figure out if these two things are are fairly. The same thing, like these two gyms are the same, these two clubs are about the same, they provide me the same things, these gyms provide me the same equipment and all that kind of stuff for the same hours. Which one is a better deal? And then it kind of depends, right? So I want you to work on this for a minute. Uh, the awesome club is $100 to join and uh, it's $10 per month. The amazing club only costs $30 to join. Yes. If you join, it costs just $30, but then it costs $20 per month, right, which is more per month. Uh, write two equations, two equations, one that gives, gives the total cost. So when I say gives the total cost, I mean like cost equals some expression. 
And when I ask for the other one, it says the total cost. I mean, the cost equals, because it's given by this expression, so the cost of the awesome club, that's the W, and which is the amazing club. Says the awesome club is a better deal. How'd you determine that? Uh, I did uh, C uh, times 100. 100 plus 10 M. 10 M for months, okay. And then C equals 30 plus 20 M. Mm -hmm. So what makes the awesome club a better deal? I did it for one year, which is 12 months, so 10 times 12 is 120 uh -huh. plus 100. Two hundred forty plus plus thirty is what? Uh, two seventy. Two seventy. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's cheaper. Yes. If you're just looking to be awesome for a month or two, it's not. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. If you're looking to be awesome for a month or two, it's not a better deal. You need to be awesome for a long, long time. So if we're awesome for one month. For awesome for one month, how much does that cost you? Some coin. <laughs> it's what? $110 for one month versus 50 for, uh, oh sorry, for one month we get 50. So then it's a better deal to be a part of the Amazing Club, right? Can we really say one's a better deal than the other one? Yeah. Depends on what you're looking for. So we can't say it's, it is a better deal. Depends. Are we going to find out when it breaks Yeah, we're going to find out exactly when. Exactly how many months it takes. So if you're going to be awesome for just a few months, not a good deal. If you're going to be awesome for a long time, that turns out to be a better deal. And at some point, they are exactly the same deal. Right? For some number of months, even if that number of months is like 1.57 months, right? Which is not realistic. But there is some point at which they cross each other, where one surpasses the other and becomes more expensive, or one becomes less expensive, depending on how you think about it. Okay. What are you going to tell me? Because I want to take a, I want to take a walk here. I don't want to just jump in. Okay. Well, if we want to find when one becomes a better deal than the other, we need to find when they become exactly the same deal, and just after that they'll switch, right? Um, okay. So what we're saying is, this guy here, 100 plus 10n, that will give me the cost of the awesome. I want the cost of the Awesome Club and the cost of the Amazing Club to be equal. And the cost of the Amazing Club is 30 plus 20M. And so what we see is 100 plus 10M is going to be the same as 30 plus 20M. Let's get rid of all this middle stuff, set it all equal to each other, and solve or M, the number of months when they give, when they cost the same amount. So we get 70 equals 10 M, and M equals conveniently 7. What does that mean? M is 7. 7 months, the cost will be equal. 7 months, the cost will be equal. It doesn't matter if you're amazing or awesome cost-wise mm -hmm. after 7 right. months. After 7 months, you should be? Awesome. 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 Before seven months, you should be amazing. We, we do this, like I said, a lot. Uh, if we compare two services that are similar, that cost different amounts, do I want to be in this service for a long time? Well, it costs less per month, so eventually that's going to cost me less. Um, you do the same, kind of the same thing when you go to Costco, right? Because you buy more. Is it worth it though? Is it worth yes. it? How do I know if it's worth it? It is. Cost is the best no matter what. Yeah. 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 Grocery store, you get a small box. At Costco, you get like a 
Well, you gotta go to town again and waste the gas. You're gonna get like, I don't know, what you put in the cost I mean, of the gallons and all that. And there's $7. free food. It's if so this one, the price. and then you go to like Walmart. If this one costs two gallons, it's like $10. $3. Three dollars. And at Costco, this one costs a thousand dollars. Costco. I mean, pretend yeah. it's to scale. <laughs> pretend it's to scale. Yeah. But it's like Costco still wins because you get more. Like, yeah. You'll pay any more. amount for anything okay. that's bigger. Okay. Here's, here's an example. Here's an example. If you go to Costco yes. and you get four gallons, it's at least like seven dollars. Okay. You go to Walmart and you get two gallons and it's almost ten dollars or more. So you're getting a better deal at Costco. Yeah, it's like three forty-three. Yeah. What's that? Also has better conditions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, the veggie. Yeah. 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 So gotta forget the ten cent sample to get out of the deal. Hey, hey, hey! I'm not asking for all of this. Wes, participating in class, detracting from class, brought up the point that he said, "Well, it's such and such per gallon." That's what we have to look at, right? Per gallon. But even then, what if I'm not going to use very much of that stuff? Well, if you're only going to use this for like three feet in a cake, you're not going to buy like six uh, gallons of whatever you're doing. It's all on like the situation you're in. If you're going to it's the, it depends on the situation. It's the same with the Awesome and the Amazing Club. It might cost me more right now, but it's what I need, OK? Uh, or it might cost me. I will spend less money, but I might not be getting a, as good a deal, right? I might not be paying as uh, as little per ounce as I would at Costco. Are you gonna give me some anecdote about Costco? No. What? So yeah, if you're right. If you only need three things and you don't need a thousand, even if the three is like an awful deal. Yes. But it's. Twenty dollars, but the thousand is fifty. You don't need the thousand. You only need the three, so you spend less money because you're not going to use another nine hundred and ninety-seven. Or by the time I ever did, it would it would go bad. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah, totally. if I need like bouillon cubes, or I need cream of tartar, or something like that, oh. I don't need to buy a huge vat of it just because it's a great. No. And the great deal is decided by how much it costs per ounce. Right, right now, I just I want to spend as little money as possible. So even though I might be getting a terrible deal, I'll buy the, the worst deal because it's less money. And you end up saving money because you know, you're getting rid of stuff. What if you freeze all your excess? Well, that's a yeah. different situation. Yeah. There's not even any equations. Okay, here's what I want to ask you guys. So we're going to take it, as algebra often does, from the concrete to the abstract, okay? Now, now we'll look at x and y, and x and y streets. don't necessarily have to represent any particular value. Let me ask you to figure out when, where, um, I'm writing something on the board, probably a good bet you can write it in your paper in your notes rather yeah. than talking to each other. Goodness gracious, you guys are getting like worse. Getting worse. <laughs> Alright, so if you were to graph these two, um actually, let me put up here. be as accurate as possible with graph paper and everything. So we got y equals negative three, or sorry, negative x plus three. So we put an intercept there. Go down one to the right one. I didn't get myself a nice line tool. And then I'll graph this other one. Um, how can I easily graph this one here? Uh, I mean, 
plugging something for x and plugging plugging zero for x for itself for y to use the y intercept and then plugging zero for y to find the x. That should be pretty easy. Plug in zero for x, you get negative three y equals one, or sorry, negative one. So you get one third. Zero for y, we get negative x equals negative one. So x is one. So you get zero one third and one zero. So I asked you, where do they cross? Where do they intersect? Uh, right there. <laughs> where is that? Yeah, that's a point. Where is the, where are the coordinates though? Six, negative one. Six, negative, maybe, because my graphs may not be quite. Five point eight, negative one. I'll tell you, they are two nice like integers. So they're not fractions. So my graph's not going to be perfect, right? Six negative one, maybe? Maybe five negative one? How would we know if we're right? Plug what in? This? It's five. One of them? Easier. So we only have to do it in one of them? Well, I think it's correct. It has to go in both. It has to go in both, yeah. It has to go in both. And yeah. how we know that it works in both? Pitch, it will make the equations equal. Makes the equations true. Yeah, both sides equal. Okay, well, let's try it out. Uh, six and negative one. Negative one for y. Uh, six for x. That's minus, uh, sorry, minus six. Six plus three. One equals negative three. No. So that's not even a point that's on that. That was, that was a negative one. Maybe it's a five, negative one. Let's make it a five instead. That's negative two. Maybe it's like negative four. Negative four? Negative four. Well, Wait, four for x, so it might yeah. be a minus four. Yeah. Maybe it's four. Ah, three minus four. Is that negative one? Yes. Yes, it is. So we at least found a point that's on that line. Now plug to what? Plug four in for plug four and negative one into the other one. Let's see if it works, okay? Uh, so that's negative x, x is four. Right? We're guessing four negative one instead of six negative one. Uh, so four negative one, negative four minus three times negative one equals negative one. Let's see if that works. Negative four plus three, that is equal to negative one. So we did figure it out. Now, what point do you think I'm trying to make about graphs? Graphs can be unreliable. They're not exact. They're nice because they do give us an idea of how the function behaves, and it, it can help us to see, like, well, if x goes, if x gets bigger, then y is getting smaller, those kinds of things. But for precision, they may not be the best. If I wanted to be really, really precise, I would have to make, make a computer do it for me, and. And uh, that would give me a better guess. But in the end, when we're relying on our eyes to look at a point in space, it's really, at best, it's a really good guess. Right? Just a good, good guess. But I'm, I'm really just throwing guesses at the both of the equations anyway. And it's certainly better to have graphed them and then have like, oh, OK, somewhere in here, clearly the intersection. Not way over here, not up there, not down there. Right? It's definitely somewhere over here. So I can just throw those points in. But what if it's a fraction? Right? Now we're really in trouble. Okay. So there's got to be a better way, a more precise way. Can you think of a more precise way than that? Number. We're going to do it with, yeah, with numbers, with equations, with algebra. Plug what? Plug one. <laughs> OK. But we're back to guessing, making good guesses. But then what if what if the real correct guess has a fraction in it? How will I guess that from the, is it 3 fourths, is it 2 thirds? Or <coughs> make it a system of equations. Well, it already is a system of equations. But set them equal to each other, maybe? 
Okay, we'll take these two equations and realize if I find a point on the graph where these two intersect, we just kind of showed it backwards, then we're looking for an x and a y that work in both of the equations. Right? We want the x to be the same and the y to be the same for both equations. So we take that and move it to the next page. I want to figure out which x comma y can I take this x and plug it in for both places, and take this y, plug it in there, and there, and both equations will be true. There's only one, right? There's only one place these two lines are going to cross. So, Mitch says set them equal to each other. How, how can I set these equal to each other? You put the x on one side, you can make the x's equal to each other and then have the rest of the equation. Get the x on one side, like solve for x? Yeah. Sure, solve for x. What if I solve for y? Because this is already solved for y. Either way, it's going to work. Okay. So we got negative 3y equals x minus 1, because I added x to both sides in this equation. And then y equals negative 1 third x plus one-third. Makes sense? Divide by three on both sides, I get x divided by three, and I got uh, one divided by three, this is the sign switch is divided by negative three. So, like we said, this y and this y, we want them to be identical, so then this must be the same as this. Negative x plus three must give the same y as negative one-third x plus one-third. Solve for x. What would you do first to solve for x in this equation? Minus three. Okay. I'm going to give you a nice little tip for whenever you're working on an equation. You want to solve for Time x. And you have negative fractions. three over one. Times negative three over one. Yeah. I don't think it really matters. I I would just go ahead and multiply by three, yeah. just so that. I would have the negative 3 may be more convenient. But if you multiply by 3, on this side we get negative 3x plus 9. What happens on this side when I multiply this by 3 and this by 3? Distribute that. Oh, they just both turn in that x. Yeah, the 3 cancels the 3. I'm left with negative 1x. If it cancels this 3, that's bad. Right? You don't have to deal with fractions. Just cancel out all the denominators. So then I'll add 3x and get 2x. Subtract 1 equals 8, and x equals 4. Are you surprised that x is 4? Why not? Haven't we already done this? By graphing? And we guessed our way to x is 4, and y is negative 1? Why? So if I take this x is 4 and I plug this x back in here, what do you think I'll get for y? Negative 1. Yeah, exactly. Negative 4 plus 3, negative 1. That's what y is. So we found the place where they intersect. By solving them both for y and setting them to each other. So we have, we have two approaches. What, what good is graphing? I like graphing to be a good idea if I want to find where they intersect. To visually see it. Because you can see it. Why is graphing not so good? Because you can see it. It's not. It's, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not. It can be misleading. It can be misleading. It's good because you can see it. You can see where that point should be. But if my graph isn't laser beam accurate, then it may not be exactly the right point. Okay. Uh, so if we're just trying to guess, graphing is a good, a good way to get a good guess. But if we want to do it exactly right the first time, we're going to do it by uh, what we call substitution. We're going to solve for y both, and then set them equal to each other. Or solve for x for both, and then set them equal to each other. It's just that we'll be finding y first, and then we'll get x.